Perfect. Thanks, Steve, for, uh, for, for hosting this, and thanks to ARM for hosting the conference. Um, so Histogenics is a, uh, is a, is a uh, cell therapy company that's focused on the orthopedics uh, market. We have a uh, platform technology that combines the use of uh, cells, biomaterials, and bioengineering that uh, we use to create a new class of therapies that we're calling restorative cell therapies. Simply put, restorative cell therapies are therapies that are designed to get patients pain relief more rapidly than the currently available treatment options that they have and get them back to doing what they like to do more quickly as well. The first product that's an example of the uh, platform technology is a product called Neocart. Neocart is an autologous cell therapy that's in phase three uh, clinical development right now. I'll talk more about that in a second, but it's actually designed to treat card to repair cartilage defects initially in the knee. Ultimately, uh, we think that it's a very powerful uh, technology. It's, uh, we finished enrollment in the phase three clinical trial in the second quarter of last year. We're expecting top line data in the middle of the third quarter of this year. Subject to positive data, our intent is to submit a BLA to the FDA by the end of the third quarter this year, which if you roll the clock forward based on our current assumptions, leads to a potential approval and launch towards the end of 2019. The market uh, for uh, cartilage defects in the knee is very large. In the US alone, there's about 1.2 million arthroscopic procedures every year in the US that are designed, uh, uh, that, are, that are associated with cartilage defects in the knee. Uh, of those uh, 1.2 million folks, only about 500,000 of them actually go on to get any type of procedure, and we think that's because of sort of the lack of satisfaction on the part of patients and physicians um, with the currently available options to them. Of the 500,000, about 200 to 250,000 uh, folks get a procedure called debridement. Debridement is simply a pain control uh, only. It is um, basically what the, it's an arthroscopic procedure where the physician will go in and basically clean out any rough edges of, uh, by the defect bed. And by the way, a cartilage defect in the knee looks a lot like a pothole in a road or a divot on a golf course. And so uh, what the surgeon will do is go out and clean the defect bed, take any loose pieces out. Pain relief only, it also prevents locking and clicking. Um, it doesn't treat the underlying problem. The next biggest sort of category of procedures uh, to treat cartilage defects in the knee is something called microfracture. It's a surgical procedure, also done arthroscopically. Um, and what they do is they drill tiny holes at the site of the defect bed with the goal of recruiting mesenchymal stem cells from the bone marrow, which will then somehow magically differentiate into cartilage cells. Um, the challenge that you have is, is that in adults, none of us are capable of growing cartilage anymore. And so what you more often wind up with uh, than not is either scar tissue or fibrous cartilage tissue, which ultimately takes a very long time for patients to get back to doing what they like to do, oftentimes a year or more. And actually about a third of the patients who receive microfracture will actually wind up in another, having another procedure um, once they, uh, you know, within uh, two years after their first procedure. And so ultimately we think that there's a big opportunity here to uh, expand the market and offer patients and physicians a, a, a better opportunity. A uh, couple other points I'll just add. If you can fix uh, cartilage defects in the knee, we think the, the technology platform is incredibly powerful. If you can fix it in the knee, you can fix it in other joints. We have uh, plans to go after once we, if we see positive data in the knee, things like ankle, toe, and hip, for example, and geographic expansion as well. And so one example of the geographic expansion is we don't intend to go internationally on our own, um, whereas, for example, in the U.S., we do intend to launch the product on our own. But uh, internationally, we, we intend to uh, go after other markets via collaborations and partnerships. And actually, last December, one example of that is we signed a collaboration with a company called Medinet. Uh, Medinet is a leading cell therapy company in Japan. Um, and uh, just as a reminder for folks who may or may not be familiar with the company, it was a $10 million upfront payment. We received the proceeds from that in January. A total of uh, potential $77 million in additional milestones and then tiered royalties on sales of the product. And in exchange for that, Mennet got uh, development and commercialization rights for the Japanese market. Um, the Japanese market is a very attractive market, so reimbursement is in place and it's quite good. It's about $20,000 for the unit itself, $20,000 US dollars compared to about 40,000 for the unit itself in the US. And so uh, Japan also, the underlying market has a number of, uh, of commonalities with the US. And so we think it's a very attractive uh, market and we're excited to get that clinical trial going with, uh, with Mennonet uh, in the back half of this year. So really the nice thing about that is, is you could actually see based on the timelines, the, the requirements for, from the PMDA for approval in Japan, full approval, 
was to run a trial uh, that was very similar to the phase two trial we ran here in the United States a number of years ago. So 30 patient trial, two to one randomization, neocarto microfracture. Um, and ultimately we have to show a trend of statistical improvement over uh, uh, neocar versus microfracture, not, not statistically significant improvement. So we're very excited about that. And ultimately, if you roll the clock forward, those timelines could have neocart on the market in Japan around the same time, actually, or just shortly after it reaches the market in the U.S. Maybe you can just elaborate on what you mean by the trend in, in statistically, statistical significance. Is there a p-value cutoff that you need to hit? Or? No, there actually is no p-value cutoff, is my understanding. So because of the robust set of data that we have, both clinical and non-clinical, from so many years of, of doing what we've been doing in the United States, when we talked to the PMDA in Japan, um, they were very clear and they said, look, we, we want you to recreate what you did in, in uh, when you need a small uh, trial in Japanese patients. We want you to recreate what you did in the U.S. in, in the phase two trial, but it did not need to show statistical significance, which is, is important because if, you, if it needed to, you would wind up having to enroll to, to power that trial sufficiently to show significance. You'd have to enroll a lot more than 30 patients. Uh, okay, so maybe also um, just staying on the knee, um, there's some heterogeneity in the patient population in terms of lesion size. You mentioned the divot uh, and the pothole. Uh, maybe you can talk about who you're targeting and why uh, and, and how the, the, the trial that you're running is conducive to, to that target market. Sure, good question. So um, we're, as I mentioned before, we're targeting those, uh, those patients that would ordinarily get a microfracture procedure. So microfracture tends to work well in slightly smaller lesion sizes. Interestingly, the average lesion size in our phase two trial and our phase three trial was about two centimeters squared. So about, you know, maybe the size of your fingernail, basically. So these are not, these are not huge, you know, huge lesions to start with. However, if you leave them untreated in an adult, they tend to get bigger and bigger, which leads to bone on bone wear, which potentially leads to osteoarthritis and a potential total knee replacement. And so if you look in the literature, one of the reasons why folks have uh, many of uh, uh, the total knee replacements actually find their way back to a cartilage defect. Um, in terms of, of the, the average lesion size, we think that by and large the bulk of folks getting microfracture procedures today, and it's hard to actually get data on specific lesion sizes of between X and Y and, and what percentage of that 150,000, but we think by and large the bulk of those 150,000 are probably somewhere between one and a half centimeters and probably around four centimeters squared is our, is our guess. Okay, that's great. And, and just in terms of the endpoints uh, in your trial, so they're functional endpoints, um, also looking at MRI data um, to look at collagen layering. So how important are those endpoints in relative terms, and, and how important is it to understand mechanism uh, of neocart as well in terms of repairing cartilage by imaging versus some of the functional endpoints? Yeah, so interesting, good, good question, and, and the trial, our phase three trial actually is pretty unique in that there's a couple of things that are unique about it. First of all, it is being conducted under our special protocol assessment with the FDA. Secondly, um, it has a one-year primary endpoint, and actually that's very unique to if you look at all the other trials that are out there that are generally two-year primary endpoints, and we think that has a lot to do with the specific mechanism of action of neocart, in as much as um, our ability, the platform technology that we have enables us to make tissue ex vivo. And so what that enables is basically instead of relying on the body to actually do that recovery, you know, in the body, we're actually doing that in our facility uh, just outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And by the time we release the neocart implant uh, for the patient to be treated, we look at, we have a, a series of release criteria. We look at things like uh, collagen one, collagen two ratios. We look at histology of the implant. We also look at, for example, um, biomarkers of DNA. And so we've actually, not only do we have that, but we've, and, and we think that's important from a clinical perspective, we've also tied that to non-clinical data that we've generated with our, with our partners at Cornell University through a collaboration we have with them. The, uh, in, the, as for the rest of the endpoints, obviously we're looking at improvement in pain and function. We have a unique dual threshold responder analysis that looks at both COOS pain and IKDC subjective. And so in order to get to into that dual threshold responder bucket, you have to show clinically meaningful uh, increases in both COOS pain and the IKDC subjective. These are patient reported outcomes. And then there's also independent evaluations of function that are done at one year as well. Um, so ultimately, that's, that's what the FDA, if you look at their guidance document, which came out actually after our clinical trial, that's actually, that mirrors what we have in our, in our trial. Our trial is somewhat like the FDA guidance, but a little bit souped up. Um, secondary endpoints are uh, looking at the layering, cartilage layering via MRI. 
Um, although it's an important endpoint, one of the things that the FDA has concluded over time is that it's nice to be able to see the fill, but you also need to be able to see the quality of the fill as well, which is why they're very focused on pain and function. Great. And, and looking ahead at, to a potential launch, um, just first on manufacturing, where are you currently? Um, what is the capacity for manufacturing Neocart? Um, and, and, and what would be the sequence of events towards scaling up uh, after approval to expanding uh, your target market and your capabilities? Sure, good question. So um, our plan is to launch actually uh, <clears throat> with commercial capacity right out of, of the same facility that we've been making clinical neocarts in for a number of years now. We've got, um, we're doing some renovations to that facility right now in advance of a potential pre-approval inspection hopefully sometime uh, next year. Um, the plan is to launch with $20 million of, <clears throat> of revenue generating capacity um, out of that facility. And then we think about scale up, actually we think about it more, our, our chief operating officer calls it really scale out than scale up. And the idea is we've got a modular expansion strategy where we basically take the same exact process, same exact equipment, and we put it in another clean room. And so we think about expansion in increments of $100 million of revenue generating capacity, which is 2,500 units. Of, of production uh, capacity. And the thought is, is that it takes about 18 to 24 months to get that all, to get the equipment ordered, the installed, validated, and in place, and uh, which costs about $10 million of capital. And then you obviously have to hire and train some people to work in the new clean rooms. But we think it's actually a pretty straightforward process because it's, it's a little bit different than, for example, if you go to a biologic where you have to, where you have to take logarithmic steps to expand your output. This is more a like for like and just putting it, just expanding what you have. Okay, great. And then on, on sales and marketing, um, I guess, how, how large of a sales force would you need um, to cover the orthopedic surgeons that, that you need to touch? And, and um, where do you see the sweet spot, I guess, in terms of, of building out that sales force in, in terms of size? Sure, good question. So, um, you know, reimbursement for the product is in place, so that's actually taken care of already. We actually do have work to do. We've obviously, we've started doing some, we've already done work with payers. We're starting to do more work with payers, and we'll continue that uh, subject to receiving positive phase three data in mid Q3 this year. Um, but our plan is to launch the product, as I mentioned ourselves. We think ultimately it's going to be a, our, our plan is to do a, a boutique type launch high patient and high physician experience. We're actually going to target the sites in our phase three clinical trial. So there were 32 sites in the uh, phase three trial in the U.S. Uh, that participated. Um, at those sites, there's a total of about 90 physicians, of which about 45 of them participate in our clinical trial. So we sort of have a built-in user base already. Um, based on our market research, we know that the average uh, sports med physician surgeon sees about 10 to 20 pa uh, patients per month with a cartilage defect only treats about a third of them right now. So that actually lines up very nicely with, um, with the top level data that I cited before. And so the idea is to go to those, uh, those sites and those doctors originally, and that's how we're gonna launch. We think ultimately it's a, uh, a high science launch. So there's gonna be a fair number of MSLs that we're going to be employing. We're probably gonna look at around eight of those to start with. They'll be supported by some key account managers, five to seven of them and then some inside sales and customer service people who will basically be working with the sites to facilitate reimbursement and logistics. Um, and ultimately the idea is to get, to make sure that these sites have a, have a, a good, we know they're gonna have a good clinical experience because many of them have used the, have used the product already um, in the trial and, have, and are very uh, much in, they like the product a lot. Now the idea is to make sure from the business side it's easy for them as well. Okay, great. It looks like we're, we're out of time again. Um, so I just wanna thank John uh, once more. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it.